Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to our worship. We're so glad you've chosen to join us uh, for this service uh, and this series. And I want to give a shout out to those of you that are watching at our South Street campus or our Mill Creek campus, or if you're online, whether that's on our Facebook page or YouTube channel or our church website, we're glad you're with us uh, together today. We begin a new three-week series called The Politics of Jesus talking about religion and politics. I know people say, you shouldn't talk about religion and politics. We're going to do both for three weeks. I'm sure that some of you are thinking, come on, the election is finally over, or at least we hope it is, and we're tired of all the political talk. Others of you are thinking, look, I come to church to get away from all the political stuff. Don't bring that into the church. Believe me, I understand these sentiments, and I share the weariness of what's going on in our our culture right now. Uh, However, I think the reason we feel this way is because we associate the term political with all of the divisiveness and the partisanship and the ugliness of our current election cycle. And to call someone political in our culture in America is not a compliment. So let me just say that however you voted uh, in this election, whoever's in the White House, uh, whatever's happening in the, po- in the political sphere of our country, you are welcome here at Chapel Street Church. Let me ask this question of all of us. Is the gospel political? What do you think? Is the gospel political? What about those who say, look, I don't want to get political, just stick to preaching the gospel? Well, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is certainly not political in the ugly, divisive, partisan, calculating, and often corrupt sense of the term in our American context. It has nothing at all to do with uh, attack ads, yard signs, campaign rallies, and so forth. The term politics stems from the Greek word polis, which meant the city or the people. It was the word used for the Greek city-states in ancient Greece. And it came to, be, came to refer to the sensible, wise, and prudent decisions made for the common good of the people living there. In this sense, the gospel is absolutely political. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, verse 43. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns and cities as well. For in this, this is the purpose for which I was sent. I preach the good news, the gospel, of the kingdom. He's talking about a kingdom. To other towns and cities, other people. It's for their good. So in this series, we're going to seek to examine our politics through the lens of Jesus and his kingdom and not the other way around. And that's really important that we get that straight. In week one, we're going to look at Jesus and government. The next week, we'll look at Jesus and citizenship. And then finally, we'll look at Jesus and hope. Because Politics has a lot to do with where we place our hope. Okay, today, Jesus and government. Is government a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? Is government a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the answer for most of us is contextual, isn't it? I mean, it depends. When the government uh, of your town tears up the street in front of your house, that's a bad thing, bad government, right? Or when you get a ticket on the red light camera uh, and they mailed to you in the mail, that's a bad thing, bad, bad government. But what about when you turn on your faucet and the water flows freely? What about when you call 911 and the ambulance shows up and saves a life? That's a good government. The answer is the government is neither 100% good nor 100% bad, but it is necessary. And God has something to say to us about it. The classic text in the New Testament on the role of human governments and our relationship to them is in the, Paul's letter to the Romans, the 13th chapter. So I'm going to read. You can follow with me. We're going to read Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And uh, just as a little bit of a warning here, J.C. Ryle in his commentary says, These seven verses have caused more confusion among Christians throughout history than any other verses in the New Testament. I'm not sure if he's right, but <laughs> we're going to try to unravel that uh, here today. So Romans chapter 13. Verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. 
Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. All right, now, I'm sure that some of you are, have a lot of questions right now. It's hard to read that passage and not go, wait, 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 wait. What about, what about, uh, there's questions we all have. Now, first of all, the passage is not making an argument for what kind of government is best, what policies are best, what the structure should be, but to show us, in general, God's view of human governments in general and our relationship to them. And, and interestingly, governments show up in the Bible long before Romans 13. In fact, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God says to Adam and Eve, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule, have dominion over it. That's sometimes referred to as the dominion mandate. In other words, government is dominion, ruling, stewarding, taking care of God's creation. Human structures, early on, just Adam and Eve, set in place to carry out God's dominion mandate at the family level, at the tribal level, at the national level. Now, tragically, we never got to see what human governments would look like without the corruption and being tainted by sin because Genesis 3 happened so fast after Genesis 1. And all of creation, including governmental structures, were impacted by the fall, by sin, by corruption. We certainly see that today. But the fall, sin, evil, doesn't make government less necessary. In fact, it makes government more necessary and at the same time, more dangerous. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, we read that in those days, there was no king, no government in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in case you don't know the story, it did not turn out well. It was chaos, anarchy, it was a mess. So anarchy, or lack of government, no structures, is not a solution to the problem of sin and corrupt government. Okay, back to Romans 13. The problem to, for me, one of the struggles I have with this text, it, it, just in my own, just in reading it, is that verse one sounds so definite. Let every person, by the way, the word person there is the Greek word suke, also translated soul, uh, living being. Let every living, breathing person be subject to the governing authorities. Every person, all authorities. I would be much more comfortable if it said things like, you know, let, let every person be subject to the good governing authorities or to some governing authorities or to most of them. It doesn't give us much wiggle room here. And we have to ask, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. What, what about Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, I mean, uh, Genghis Khan? <laughs> subject to all authorities? You can't mean that, certainly. How are we to make sense of this? We'll hold that question. I promise we're going to come back to it because it's a good one. But the first thing we see here at a, at, a, at a broad macro level is this. This is the overarching principle. There is no authority except that which God has established. There is no, Romans 13.1 makes this crystal clear. There is no authority except that which God has established. He says it, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. It's precisely what Paul says. Now, to be clear, Paul is not saying that God personally appoints or approves of every corrupt government or every wicked dictator. That's not what he's saying. He's saying all human authority is derivative. It comes from a source, and that source is God. Even if those rulers don't acknowledge God or act in, in ways that betray God's law, they still are in their position because that authority is de derived from divine authority. Jesus says this in John chapter 19, verse 11, speaking to Pontius Pilate, who has earthly authority over him and is going to sentence him to be crucified. Pilate says to Jesus in, in that verse, he says, don't you realize I have authority to let you live or die? He says, don't you realize my authority? Think about that. Think of Pilate, Roman governor, talking to the Son of God, saying, don't you realize my authority? And what does Jesus say? He says, you would have no authority over me at all if it were not given to you from above echoing what we see here in Romans 13, or Romans 13 echoing Jesus' words, I should say. From the beginning, human dominion is derived from God. All authority, that means parental authority, moms and dads. That means pastoral authority in the churches. That means political authority and civic authority. It means police authority, military authority, educational authority. All authority is derived from God's divine authority, even if and when those people in positions of power do not recognize where it comes from which is most. 
But what, got, what we're seeing here is that to have a government that's functioning right, whatever structure, needs to be acknowledging God. Needs to be, the more we're acknowledging who he is and what his word says, the better off the structures will be at the family level, at the tribal level, at the national level, at the global level. The greater and clearer the recognition of this truth, the more just and ordered a family, a society, a nation will be. Now, the next principle deriving from this is all human governments derive their authority from God's authority. All human governments get their authority from God's authority. Uh, verses 2 and 3, which I'll just read for you again. They, they say, Paul puts this in a very clear way, but it's troubling to us. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good. You'll receive his approval. One thing is clear here. Christians are not called to be anarchists or subversives. The calling of the Christian life is not that we're supposed to overthrow governments or we're, we're, we're the hashtag resist movement. Let me give you a quick picture, this might help us, of what the political world of the New Testament was like when Paul wrote this. Rome ruled the known world. The Roman Empire was the world, as far as anybody knew at that time. And Rome at this time was no longer a republic, the Senate had been reduced to the, really the access only for wealthy part, uh, patricians who served their own interests but had very little political power. Rome had become imperial, dominated by the authoritarian power of Caesar, the emperor, who had unilateral power and authority. He, in fact, we see this throughout the New Testament. Caesar took a census of the known world, we told in, in Luke chapter 2, that, and that he uh, implemented taxes for not the nation, the world. The power of Caesar was beyond what we can really comprehend. And there was an annual day in the Roman Empire of declaring your allegiance to Caesar. In order to keep your standing as a citizen, a faithful citizen, you had to swear allegiance to Caesar and you were given a little libellus, a little, a little certificate, like carrying your papers around, a passport that you could use to say, I'm a citizen in good standing. The emperor in Paul's day was a man named Nero. We've talked about him before. Brutal, notorious, violent. He, he killed anybody who disagreed with him, including some of his wives. He had his own mother put to death. Uh, there was a great fire in Rome in 64 AD, and he blamed that on the Christians and said about a massive persecution. This is the guy ruling the known world. Israel, at this time, was occupied territory within the Roman Empire. They had... Roman appointed governors, Pontius Pilate, Felix, Festus, we read about them in the New Testament. And they allowed uh, the Jews puppet kings. Herod the Great was a puppet king under Roman rule. And these puppet kings, the Herodians and others, could do pretty much what they wanted as long as they did two things. Kept the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and made sure taxes were paid to Rome. If they did those two things, no unrest, no, no revolt, and pay your taxes, then Rome pretty much ignored whatever else they did. This is the context in which Paul calls us, the people he's writing to and us, to be subject to governments and authorities. It's shocking, really, that three times Paul refers to the government as servants. Let me read to you verses 3 and 4 again of Romans 13. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And then later he calls them, again, servants of God. The Greek word used there for servant is the word diakonos. It's the same word Paul uses in other areas of his New Testament letters, referring to ministers or servants in the church. The same word. How can Paul call governments like the Roman government a servant of God, God's servant. When's the last time you saw flashing lights in your rearview mirror and thought, ah, a servant of the Lord, come for my good? When's the last time you saw a political ad or a political sign as you drove by and thought, ah, a servant of the Lord, for my good? For most of us, never. For some of our, our brothers and sisters of color, they don't think of the police at all as servants of God. But that's what Paul is saying is intended. And the fact that we see injustice and, and, and abuses only highlights what God intends for it to be, which is why we react when it's not that way. 
Again, there are bad politicians and corrupt officials in governments. Nevertheless, they hold the positions they hold because God intended it to be for justice and protection, which is, again, why we cry out when it's not working that way. So Paul is laying out here what we would call the dual role of government, the dual role of government in our lives. First role is to restrain evil. So the dual role of government, to restrain evil, and second, to promote good. This is God's intent for human systems of government and authority. Now, to restrain evil means protection uh, and punishment. To protect those who are, are uh, maybe violated by those who would break the law and to punish those who do break the law. That's restraining. And to promote good, peace and justice, setting standards and laws and rewarding those who do right. Now, honestly, it's hard to read Romans 13 from the perspective of those who heard it in Paul's day. We're Americans. We are, in the world's economy, those in positions of privilege and power, some of us more than others. It's, we read this from an American context, and it's easy to read this and think, yeah, yeah, I get it, Paul. Follow the law, obey the rules, and it's going to be fine for you. But if you don't, you kind of get what you deserve. But Paul's writing to people on the margins of society, people that were outliers, people that were persecuted for their faith. He's writing to people that were not in positions of power and privilege, people being persecuted. How can he say this then? Well, think about this for just a minute. Nero, Caligula, Domitian, these are the emperors during the New Testament time. These were no friends to Christianity, brutal and ungodly dictators. Yet it was under their rule that the conditions provided by the Roman Empire allowed the gospel to flourish and the church to expand. The Pax Romana, the relative peace, you could travel in relative peace for the first time in human history. Roads leading to all parts of the Mediterranean world were, which were not available before. The common language, the Koine Greek, a common language and currency and travel and exchange of ideas, all these things flourished under Rome, which made it possible for the gospel to go to all parts of the world and the church to expand. And this all happened underneath the rule and the reign of tyrannical, ungodly dictators. Now, does this mean that we should keep quiet about injustice, keep our heads down and be submissive? No, no, it doesn't. But it does mean at least this, God is doing far more than we often see in our context. God's up to things that we don't imagine and see beyond our own little context. Right now, we're in a moment of tension in our nation. Transfer of power, hopefully a peaceful transfer of power. But God's doing things on a scale we can possibly imagine. So the central idea of the New Testament is that as Christ followers, we have dual citizenship a dual citizenship. We have first a citizenship in heaven, of course, and just last series in our series Choosing Joy in the book of Philippians, we studied Philippians 3 verse 20 tells us, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven first. That's our first allegiance. He's who we're, we're loyal to first. And second, citizenship on earth. Our citizenship here on earth. Now, next week's sermon is going to deal specifically with citizenship on earth. Uh, and we'll get into when Jesus talks about paying taxes to Caesar, give, it to, give to the one that is owed. So I won't get into that too much, but I encourage you to tune in next week as we talk about Jesus and citizenship. But here Paul is saying that learning to live faithfully in, in both the heavenly sphere and the earthly sphere requires being subject to the authorities God has placed over you. The Greek word for let every person be subject to, the Greek word for subject or obedient is the word hupotasso. It's a military term. It means to line up underneath in ranks or to line up under, to willingly place yourself under the authority of another, in this case, human government. A voluntary act and attitude of willingness, submission to the governing authorities. Let me put it to you this way. You honor God by obeying and honoring the government. I think for many Americans, that's a hard thing to hear. We don't like that. We want to put conditions around that. We want to say, well, what, 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 hold on. Only if I like what the government's doing or if my party's in power. No, the Bible's clear. No authority exi exists except that which God has established. And one of the ways we honor God and his authority is by being obedient to the authority he, that, we're, that we're living under on earth as citizens of earth. 
The gospel and Christianity are revolutionary, but not in the way we think of that. Not in the French Revolution terms, the Russian Revolution terms. Not in the sense of an armed, violent overthrow. It's actually a far more powerful revolution. The Roman Empire is gone, friends. The church remains. The gospel still remains and expands. Okay, I know now many of you, many of you are still struggling with this central question. Yeah, okay, but what about? All right, what about? What are we to do when the human government is actually promoting evil and punishing good? What, what happens when the government is doing the opposite of what God intends? When it's calling good evil and evil good? What if the government is actually trying to compel us to do something that violates God's law? What then? Well, let me go back to verse 5 for a minute. Paul says in Romans 13, verse 5, Therefore, one must be in in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. In other words, you do what's right, not just because you're afraid of getting punished if you don't, but because it's the right thing to do. That word conscience, then, what happens if what's being asked of us by the earthly government violates our conscience because it violates the word of God? Not just we don't like it, we don't prefer it, we don't agree with it. That's not what Paul's saying. But when it violates the word of God or our conscience. Here's the principle. Let me give you the principle, then we'll try to apply it. We obey the government up to the point that obedience to the government would mean disobedience to God. We willingly, humbly, joyfully obey the government right up to the point that obedience to the government would mean disobedience to God. Now, sometimes this is clear, and it's really just a matter of spiritual courage. Are we courageous enough and trusting God enough to to obey him rather than the law of the land? Sometimes it's not so clear, and it's more a matter of spiritual discernment. We have to pray and seek wise counsel and think deeply about these things. Civil disobedience, the aim of Christian civil disobedience is to follow God, to obey God. Let me say that again. The aim of Christian civil disobedience is not to disobey the government, but to obey God. That's the point. That's why we would ever do it. It's easier to submit to governing authorities when we have the proper perspective of who we actually are, our identity in Christ, who we belong to, where our first citizenship is in heaven. We, we do not exchange our worldly rights, uh, we, our, our heavenly rights for our worldly rights. We're not guaranteed safety or prosperity in this world. And our hope is not in man-made laws. Our hope is in Christ. Now, whether civil disobedience is ever necessary depends on the civil authority and the relative freedoms we have as citizens. For example, it's not necessary today to break the law of the United States in order to fight for the rights of the unborn, to fight against abortion. There are organizations and ministries that carry on that fight within the law, and we should support them and pray for them and partner with them. But in ancient Israel, the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, Pharaoh ordered them to kill the sons of the Hebrew slaves, and they had to break the law of Pharaoh, the land of Egypt, in order to obey the law of God. In the 19th century America, abolitionists had to break the law in order to rescue people out of slavery. Today, the International Justice Mission works within the law and structures and systems in order to set people free from sex trafficking and human slavery. So balancing civil disobedience and godly submission is a powerful witness for the gospel. It's easy to fall off one side or the other, to just blindly obey when there's clear injustices, or to fall into the revolutionary overthrow by violence. It shows what our priorities are where our loyalties lie. If if we find ourselves crying foul at everything we don't like, I think that tells us something. But if we face, just because we face inconvenience and hardship and persecution, even death, but quietly reserving civil disobedience for those times only when a law would force us to violate the law of God. And prayerfully, carefully. There are so many examples of this in, in the Bible. Just give you a couple. Daniel uh, served in the court of a pagan Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, actually two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. And he served faithfully there, even though he was under the rule and reign of one who ignored God, denied God, and instituted laws that were certainly not godly. However, Daniel also refused on certain occasions to obey the law of the land in order to be faithful to his God. 
In chapter 5, under King Darius, Nebuchadnezzar's successor, we know the story of the lion's den, right? He's faithful to his God. Peter and John, the New Testament, there's a law, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, uh, under, it set a law, a religious law, that you're not allowed to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. This is after his death and resurrection uh, and, and ascension. And Peter and John say to the Sanhedrin, the same council that strong-armed Pilate into putting Jesus to death on the cross, they say, look, we must obey God rather than you. We can't help but preaching in this name. In other words, we're going to continue because God has called us to do that. There are historical examples of this. William Wilberforce, Frederick Douglass, Corey Ten Boom, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But we should not be quick to put ourselves in these camps. These are, our calling is to be humble, faithful Christian men and women who have our allegiances in the right order. And sometimes for us, living in the relative freedom in America, one of the most powerful witnesses we can have is to, be, is to call out injustice, to fight for justice, to fight for the rights of those who are being oppressed, and to surrender our own rights in the process. To be willing, faithful subjects of the government that God has placed over us, even when we don't like it, even when we voted different, even when we pr would prefer it to be different. Now, I know there are other questions, and this is no easy calling. But I think if, if, if those of us living in the American West could get this much right, there's no authority except that which God has established. And our government, as broken and messed up as it may be, only exists because it has, it's, it, God allows it to. And he intends it to be for our good, even when it's not. So we don't follow it blindly, but out of obedience to God, we should be obedient citizens within it until such a time as the government would require us to break God's law. And then with humility and grace, we simply say, this far but no farther, we can't. This is not an easy calling. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, and so do you. So God's vision and plan for government is not that it's perfect, not that it replaces, and not that it becomes our hope, but it's instituted by him for our good. I want to be a faithful and obedient servant of God, don't you? Part of that means bringing myself under the authority of the government he has established and trusting him with whatever comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you humbled yourself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross for our sake. You subjected yourselves to, yourself to ridicule and scorn and persecution and torment. You gave up your authority and power to liberate us from the tyranny of sin. Help us to live like you in this world, to be faithful and obedient to the authorities you have established. At the same time, Lord, give us clear eyes to see when those governments and authorities are violating your law and instituting injustice. Help us to fight within those structures with, with the revolutionary means of the gospel to bring about your good purposes. In all things, Lord, we submit to you that we, we only see a fraction of all that you're doing. We trust you with the future, not just our future immediately or our nation, but of all things, we give you great praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.